Well, good afternoon, everyone. All right, good to see all the faces back. Most everybody coming back. All right, okay. Um, I wanted to mention to everybody here that we can start thinking about, I think it's a little loud, you got echoing coming in. Um, we, take, we take possession, God willing, it continues like it's going through, um, to the property up in Carrier. Uh, on the 17th of November, or if they get it done before that, uh, we'll be right before. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is uh, by the end of the month or maybe the first week or second week in December, we can sit down and talk about it next week at Potluck. And uh, I'd like to have a Sunday picnic out there for everybody. I, I really like, you know, I talked to Alex. He, he can help grill us some stuff. And you talk an hour away from here, hour and a half maybe max. And it's been most of the day in fellowship and take some time to thank God and praise God for the opportunity. Um, I don't know the depth of what's going to be developed that God's using us for to do this. But all I can do is go back and think about the time when we walked into this building. And I remember walking around it and it was an incredible peace. And some of you who are still here that were there at the beginning, a lot of our members have died since then said the same thing. I remember walking around that parking lot out there, and everybody says, man, it just feels so peaceful here. And, and it was one of the, con- the uh, confirmations, I believe, that God gave us that his hand was in it for all of us. Of course, when you opened that door and you came in, and my mother-in-law gave out the scream and said, Tom has lost his ever-loving mind this time. <laughs> I love it this time, in the, the way she said that. And... Uh, and my prayer was, I told God, I said, man, I don't know why you gave us such a big building. I said, I, I would never use it. We kind of sort out grew this a little bit. And so there's some of the things that's on the drawing board now, we, we need more space. We need more, uh, and we need to, be, believe it or not, get the work out of this city. This is a horrible city. Uh, I think everybody here agrees to that. The process of doing that is going to be difficult for each one of us. It's going to be difficult for all of those who are, who are tuning in and people are saying, I'd like to move out there. <coughs> Two of the advanced people moving out to here will be here next week. Uh, Elwood and his, uh, his new bride who got married here, Kay, uh, about a year ago. I, I don't remember exactly how long it was. And uh, Chuck Baker and his family. Both are coming down to look at properties next week to buy to make the move. And so uh, we'll grow by just for them alone, and they're all looking forward to coming down here. My point of saying all this is that the process of moving out there, I felt the same peace when I, when I walked around that property. You, I can't tell you the incredible sense of awe and, res, and love and respect and peace that I walk around that property. And when I talked to the, the inspector who was inspecting the building, um, and when it was all said and done, he's just standing there and he's looking over everything. He says, man, what a place. And uh, he said, by the way, what did you pay for? And I told him. And he put his head down and he shook. I said, oh, man, I'm thinking my love of the, of the land and, and what God had led me to, that he, he moved us to pay way too much, is what I honestly thought my initial thought was. And we had never had a lot of money before. And it just, it just so happened in, in the last two years, a lot of money just flooded in. And uh, we met Steve, and we talked to the ministry. And by the way, the property, uh, the decision was not made by me. It was made by the ministry at large, which always makes our big decisions. And I'm just the one who gets the blessing to be able to be the spokesman for the most part and been able to share some of the things that goes on. But Bobby will tell you, and Clayton, they're on the phone calls. You know, we advance all the information. Everybody makes, makes the decision. In fact, the funds came in so fast, I had to meet with Steve Council <clears throat> because I give Clayton all the finances every twice a year. He gets all the finances, the bank statements, everything to verify everything. And y'all know how that works. But all of a sudden, it just boomed. And then this showed up. So when I told him we paid 800000 for the property, and he just shook his head. And I said, I guess we paid too much, huh? He goes, no. He says, you obviously don't know what you got here. And I thought about it, you know, I got chills that went through me. I said, evidently I don't. He said, the land out here, raw land without much done to it. He says, the raw land out here, it, it goes for at least 10,000 an acre. 
he said cultivated land like this could be as much as 15,000 an acre. He said, so you've got property by itself without the buildings worth over a million dollars here. So what God did is he opened the door for us that two years could have never been possible. In fact, four years ago when we picked up the Daytona building, we didn't even have enough cash in the bank to pay the bills and fix the roof. But we took it on anyway. We fixed the roof and we held the checks until we had money to pay for it. The work that God's got for us today I believe is only beginning. And I know there'll be people out there, they'll, they'll think whatever they want to think. But the truth is, God's opened this opportunity for us to be able to do something, to do a work. And we can do it without having to sell this place here. Because the building was here before the actual national work began. So, so everybody here, you don't have to panic. But you're going to hear me push really hard. Get out of the city. <laughs> Just bear with me, because that's inside of me. And I know the age and health and some can't. And God will protect you where you are if you're not able to. But something's going on right now, and I'm going to share with you today in the sermon. Because I was thinking last night, and this is a long lead-in, so I want to be about 10 minutes before I actually get into the sermon. So I don't have to rush. And so Clayton's looking at me because I chewed him out for going too long on the boat. <laughs> and I'm probably the biggest hindrance of that. I didn't really chew him out. I just, just, it was not a chew out. I just said, just keep an eye on your time. And he did a good job last, last week keeping an eye on his time. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that the things are moving so fast right now. It's, it's really hard. I'm going to show you something, how hard it is to keep up with everything. But right now, we're moving into a time that we really, we need to get our hands on, in, in focus to be able to do the work of God because it's moving so fast, we're not going to be able to do what we really need to do before it ends. In fact, I'm going to show you how that works with the sermon that I was, I was getting ready to give right before the feast. So putting all these things together, I went to bed last night, and I'm, and I'm praying before God, and I said, how do I, how do I take all this information that God's been blessed me with to understand and to share with everybody to make sense without confusing everybody? Because some of it gets very complicated. And some of it's very detailed, and I got a bad habit of trying to be so detailed so you pick everything up. That like yesterday, if you watched News Nuggets and Insights for this weekend, it was just information overload. I looked at the clock, I had 10 minutes left, and I wasn't halfway through the program. We just had to call a stop, and I said, I'll pick it up next week. So here's what I want to do today as we go through this. I want to do a, I want to do a lead in, and then I'm going to tell you why we're going to where we are today to show you how important it is. Because when I came into the church many years, over 50 years ago, um, things began happening. We always talked about somewhere down the road, God was going to begin doing things. And we're going to begin. Well, somewhere down the road is here. So the messages I give today, they're not messages to just make you feel good. These messages God's given us, they're walking us through a story of God revealing his end time to his elect. I believe the information is important enough for the churches of God community, all the churches out there, because some will pick up on this information, some aren't. All of them recognize there's something wrong that we're moving close to the end time and the return of Jesus Christ. But everybody keeps saying, but we could have 30 years or 40 years or 50 years. And that may be true, but I don't see it. I honestly don't see it, so I can't preach it that way. And I don't know that God's going to come in 2030, 31, 2029. 20, I have no idea. But what I'm telling you today, when you begin to see what's going on and how it unlays step by step, I think you'll agree that God's got a timetable and he's on it, whatever that timetable may be. So today, as I'm doing this sermon, I want to show you something. We're going to pick up in the sermon today, opening the second seal of Revelation. Last time I spoke, I said, had God opened the second seal? And I believe I made a case that I believe supports that God actually has opened up the second seal. And we have four strong points. Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the fruits of those points and why, where we are, and what's happening today that, that I think confirms those points of exactly where we're going. Next time I have one more that I want to do. I want to wrap it up and tie it all together to show how it's lay, laid out and what to expect in the very near future. Now, going through all these things... This is, a, this is a, sh a shot that you're looking at right now. That shot up there, let's keep that up there for a second. I'm going to show you, tell you again in just a few minutes 
about this, this shot. You've seen me bring it in over and over and over again. And the reason is this slide of all those series that you're looking at right now, God has outlaid step by step the process of how he brought us to the time frame you're in today. Never forget what Jesus Christ said to the Pharisees. You can look at the time, just like many Protestants and people around the world, many Christians, look at the conditions around the world, and they say, yeah, things are bad. Christ is getting ready to come back. And they're even putting time stamps now on raptures, when they're going to be taken away, and all these things that's going to be happening now. Well, it's all nonsense because they don't understand the Scriptures. When Jesus Christ says you err because you don't know the Scriptures. He called them hypocrites. You can see the weather, you can see the signs, but they didn't know the Son of God was standing in front of them. So here's what I'm saying. We need to understand this is from God's holy word. The information that's brought out there is not my opinion. It's documented through the scriptures and through history and the timing of the former and the latter. And the reason I keep bringing this one out is because you need to get this one in your head. If you can understand the foundation of how God's doing it, when these events happen, you won't be taken by surprise. In fact, you'll be prepared and ready for it. So let me show you something now. All right, so now let's move that aside because I'm going to go through that piece by piece again in just a few minutes. We have now moved into a new Shemitah cycle. All right, this, is the, this was last year. We monitored, reported on the events as they progressed through sermons and through N and I for the entire year. Every one of these sermon series all took place in one year of God's time cycle. So I was going back over this this morning, and I'm saying, or last night, it's like, man, that's a lot of information to try to understand. Then I thought about Ron Dart, and Ron Dart, in one of his sermons, he talked about that God brings you through cycles of learning in our spiritual lives. And he said it usually comes about when there's chaos or there's a calamity that's hit your life or changes that you've been going through. In other words, God moves you out of your comfort zone so that he can begin to work with you. And through the time of him working with you is your closeness that you bring to God means to the, the, the availability of his spirit that he begins to reveal to you. And I look back over my life, and I remember in 1978 when I got thrown out of the church simply for asking a question and not understanding place of safety. The 78 to 79, my life began to change. I realized by 79, I had a lot of knowledge from Worldwide Church of God, but I lacked the understanding. And it was through the Church, uh, the, uh, church of God International that we were, I was with for, until going to TED basically uh, was put out or, or during that period of time, you know, my dearest friends were in there. That period of time began to change my life where I began to get understanding. The information I'm revealing today or I'm understanding today about the dualities, the spirit, the form, and the latter, all that began when I got thrown out of the church. So when I'm home and I'm studying all this information and knowledge, which I had no idea what it was for or why, I just began gathering information. I just thought it was pretty neat the way God did things. And that's as simple as it was. The next major period of change came in 2015 with the sun, the moon, the stars, and the uh, blood moon tetrads. That period of time now put us on a trajectory of information and knowledge. That all kicked up last year as we got into those cycles. Now, let me show you what's going on here. So all that went through in that whole one year. In addition to these cycles or these series, there were two themes that remained constant in what I was trying to bring out throughout the year. <clears throat> and I'm using the Shemitah cycle because Shemitah cycle is seven years. You know, the whole cycle goes at the end of seven sevens. You bring it to a jubilee. You start all over. So this past year, there were two themes that continued to come up. In addition, try to understand now, this is in addition. This is what God showed us the plan and how he unveils his truth and how he shows us his appointed times. But in the meantime, there's something else going on. There were, the conditions began to change around the planet very drastically. So that was going on. And the second was, 
events that focused on and around the seals of Revelation. Those two things never left my mind as we went through the year. And we brought them out as often as I could through news nuggets and insights, which gives me more opportunity to speak and, and a little more freedom than I feel I have at a pulpit because you get in a lot more news and you have a lot more freedom to be able to do rather than a sermon on a Sabbath. So now, we've got God directing to a target and how he gets there for all of us. That all became very clear through those series. And if you can grasp that, you'll be, you'll be well ahead of the game. But in addition, these things had to happen and had to come in too. So we covered those through the conditions of our planet as we went through these things. We moved then into the seals. We began in December of last year. I began teaching the seals of Revelation. Because when you look at the end time and you look at those cycles and those series, like you're moving closer and closer to the, to the seals. What we could never understand in the past was at some point in time, God was going to begin to open the seals. And it wasn't until last year that we began to see that. And we made a pretty good case that the seal, first seal was opened last year. And I'm saying that on, uh, for a reason, because see, today I'm going to show you something about the second seal and how they all tie in and point us to another direction in that timeline. The next I picked up was in July was Evil Spirits Unleashed. Because once you realize when the seal opens up, that, that's God. He's opening up the seal. That means he's unleashing Satan to do whatever he's going to do. Or he's sending out his angels to do something. In the case we're looking at, it's unleashing evil spirits. And you can see this world has become chaotic beyond belief in this past year. We did that by July. Then as I, I, I prayed and I went through the, through the year, and I'm, and I'm saying, man, during the course of the years, like, we got to be approaching second seal, and that's what the name of the sermon was. By September, things beginning getting so hot, we must be closing in on the second seal. So I did that series, and that was done right before the Feast of Tabernacles. Some of you have not even gotten all the sermons yet from that series. This is telling you how fast things are moving. Now watch this. Those things there, and you put those together, we must always remember that God gives us a spiritual and a physical, or as I wrote here, a physical and a spiritual. All of these that align to those series that I showed you, all of these are the spiritual. This is what God was doing in the spirit world. Remember, God says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and the, and the powers of the spirit world. All of that took place. However, the fruits of the spirit world break into the physical world. So then there is the physical. The physical means pertaining to what was going on in the spirit world. So then we talked about by May... Right after, right after the uh, going into the seals by May, we're talking about the coming economic woes. Because all of these things lead into, and how do we know all these things? Because we had the series, the cycle of what's going on with the Shemitahs. We had Joseph's lane years. So what God did is he opened up an avenue of knowledge and understanding that was almost overwhelming to understand in one year. Had he not blessed me with understanding these duality of events, not knowing why and how what was going to come into pass and how they applied 40 years ago, 45 years ago, I don't know that I'd have comprehended today. And that's why I'm telling you that take the time to go back because this information you need to cherish. It's important. In God's holy word, there is life. That because when things get really bad, when it gets to wearing down of the saints, when it gets into a martyrdom, you need to have in your mindset that God is with you regardless of what he lets you go through. And then we need to work. We need to be prepared to help all those people God's going to bring out of tribulation. So then we went into that first. And as we're moving closer to the second seal, which would have taken place, I mean the second year, which would have took place at atonement that we just went through coming back from the feast this was the sermon I had intended to give 
and it was called building on this first. I built from the first. I was building on the second. And it was said, entering into the second year of lean, following the examples of Joseph. But here's what happened. Events were moving so fast. When we were at the Feast of Tabernacles, Israel was struck with war. When we came back, this got pushed out, and we began covering war. We had to send a card out for people to request that. We've got hundreds of cars came in. People are waiting for that sermon. I never got to deliver it. My brother called me the other night. He goes, he says, when did you do that sermon? I, I don't have anything on record for that. I said, sure, you must have, right around the feast, before the feast. I went back and looked, and sure enough, I didn't do it. Because it moves, events move so fast, I forgot about I was supposed to do that one. But the world events and the war and the second seal opening took precedent to this. So I thought about that. I said, well, you know, it's parallel to God says, if you're not prepared, it's going to catch you unaware. And sure enough, so when I finish this seal, because you're waiting, if you're online and you're waiting for a DVD to come in, I'm going to do it, but I have to wait till I finish this series and I got one more sermon. And God willing, something else doesn't happen, it bumps it back even further. But I've got a list of sermons that's in my PowerPoint that I start working on that I wanted to give, but each time it got bumped for the important issues of the time we live today. So all of that's being said now. I hope you see how events are moving in the information, the knowledge, and the understanding that God has given to us. It is precious. I pray you take the time to go back and review them. If you haven't seen them all, they're all online, or you can write in. Just take that one year. You're talking 12 hours, 15 hours. Just take one a week. I'm not asking you to go back to 2015, because that's so much that may just be overload. But if you can understand what God is doing, how he's doing it, you will be prepared when the next step comes. Because we're getting closer to move to the next step, which would be the third seal. If God's word is true, and I know it is. So now, with all that, I got my extra 10 minutes in, plus my 10 minute lead in, so I got 20 minutes. I still think I can make it on time and finish in an hour in the extra 10 minutes. I keep looking at Clayton because I know he's gonna look at me. So now, you ready? Let's get into it. 2 Peter 1, verse 3 says this, According to his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. When people want to get into all these arguments about the what ifs and all the other things that are out there that don't mean a hill of beans, God's word tells you, you have already been given everything you need that pertains to life. If, he, if we don't know it yet about something in the second resurrection or the third resurrection, something's going to happen in the millennium, you don't need it yet if, if it hasn't been revealed. Because God says, I'm giving you what you need right now. So he's given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. In other words, you don't have to know all the complicated ins and outs of everything I give each week. Understand the principle of what's being taught and draw back to God and use that as your foundation. Through the knowledge of him, in other words, God says, look, it's through my knowledge that you're going to be given all this information. And that's what Jesus Christ said, who's called us to glory and to virtue. The second of Peter, epistle of Peter, and the second epistle of Timothy have much in common in, re in reference to Peter here. Both epistles were the writers, they were waiting, they were waiting to be killed. They wrote that information while they were waiting to be martyred. Both of them. Both of them wrote, Timothy and Epistle and, and Peter, to the brethren who were going through the time you are about to go through. You're at that leading edge now of where God's going to take his people and his church and what's coming, and this is the focus that God tells us to have. They didn't focus on themselves. They focused on those they served. And that's what he's done with this, our church to be able to do. Here's my point. Just as God gave them what they needed for eternal life, God is giving us what we need, the end time generation, to obtain eternal life. 
All that information that we've been, been talking about for the last year or the last eight years, they didn't have a lot of that information back there. The Worldwide Church of God did not have that information. Why? Because why? They didn't need it. They had what God gave them in 2 Peter, he told them, the things that pertain to life for their generation. But at the end time, this generation, more is going to be required from you. Because, see, you're going to go through more than they ever went through. That means God has to give you more knowledge to be able to handle it. Like you're in the advanced stages now, and you're, prep, you're prepping for finals here. Remember this. Being confident in the very thing which he had begun is good work in you, he will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. So if you're here and if you're learning and all those who's going to come and hear this, if God's called you to understand the truth, he's not going to let you flounder or die as long as you don't give up. As long as you don't give up. Therefore, when God has called us to his work, he promises to give us the tools needed to successfully accomplish the mission he has called us to do. So you don't have to walk in fear. You don't have to say, well, I don't know all of that. Well, you don't need to know all of that. Just know what you need to know to do what you've got to do. Each person has a different responsibility in the work of God. And, you know, you go through the, and we've taught that in leadership, and I know I've taught it in, in minister, ministerial training classes that I've worked with with the church, is talking about this, every God puts a tool. Everybody's got a different mission in, in the church. Whatever God has called you to do, then do it the best you can. With all your might, with all your power, and the trust and the love of God. And he'll take you to wherever he wants you to go from there. Two specific points I want to bring out here. God says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And two, that's in Hosea 4, 6. God says he's going to give us the knowledge before he does anything. So if God's going to reveal the knowledge, all you have to do is stay tuned to what he's telling us. And boy, he's given us a lot to this church to be able to understand. Look at God says in Amos 3.7, He says, surely he's going to do nothing unless he revealed his secret first. So we don't have to fear. We don't have to worry about what we don't know yet. What we need to do is focus on what we do know. And God will give us the rest. And believe me, that's going to, that'll give you peace of mind when you have uncertainty when Satan trying to bring things out. This means that to understand the times we live in today, God would have to reveal to them, his people, us, Daniel 2.28, God says in heaven that reveals a secret he makes to know. In other words, when God's ready, he's going to reveal it. That's a promise. That's a, according to Daniel, he says, remember when the king Nebuchadnezzar was looking for answers to a dream? He says, hey, God reveals those things. And God, just, we just read Amos. He says, I'm going to reveal to my secret when I'm, my, my servants when I'm doing it. So all those things together all tie into where he's taking us. The two important and specific pieces of the understanding of all of this is included in to address the points at the opening of the seals. So it's important to understand that when God begins to open all those seals, there's a lot of moving parts going on around the world. You don't have to know them all. What you have to know is where you are and what God's under, brought you to understanding and that you're doing what he's asked you to do. Daniel 12, verse 9. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are sealed Close the seal to the time of the end. See the information that God's revealing today? Daniel was some, God says, greatly beloved. Somebody that God greatly beloved, he didn't even tell him what he's telling us because it wasn't necessary. But it was necessary for him to tell Daniel so that we can look at today and look back. Why? Because there's a ladder and there's a former. You have to have the word of God confirm what it is you're doing, and you go back and it's confirmed in the former. And two, Daniel 2.28, well, we just read just a second ago. Let me get my clicker here. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So all the information God's given us today that we're learning, the generations before us, they just didn't have it. Not that they did anything wrong, but just like with Daniel, God said, it isn't for you. It's for the last generation. That's us. What an incredible time you live in when you think about all this. Knowing all this, we come to a specific question that we need to address with the seals. How do we determine the difference between the second seal and we've always had wars and rumors of wars? We address that same question in the same fashion in the first seal. We started doing this 
last time I spoke with the second seal. By understanding the way God is recorded and laid out in prophecy. When you can understand the way God laid out in prophecy, it begins to break down the difference. Then you can understand, well, that's, just, that's a regular war. That's a regular, but something happened now. Everything shifts and everything changes. So that's where we are today now by understanding the second seal. How do we know it changes? Because of how he lays it out. How do we know how he lays it out? We spent a whole year putting together a various cycle of series of events that bring us to the appointed time. It all works together. So prophecy is, uh, is laid out to be understood by fulfilling what God calls appointed times. He's going to do things, and the Bible says that all through, at the appointed time. At the appointed time, he confirms the events that God has given that reveal the former and the latter, as I explained just a moment ago. God's time clock by his sevens, the Shemitahs, the Jubilees, gives us the macro of the events. In other words, we see the macro that takes the 7,000 years and eventually, as we showed in the Shemitah series, brings it down to 7 to 50, 50 years, the last jubilee, and eventually down to sevens. Eventually goes down to seven weeks. Then eventually one day, Christ returns. And he shows that through the series. Now, we understand this. This is what I brought out two years ago, and I think I brought it out in News and Nuggets just recently. What is Pearson's Law? So understanding what Pearson's Law is. Pearson's Law states this. When performance is measured, performance improves. When performance is measured and reported back, the rate of improvement accelerates. So as we understand God's holy word, how he's revealing things, we got to go back from time to time. That's why I use these series. I go back and I bring in certain on timelines because you got to go back and, and add to what you already know so that the performance can be improved. Prophecy, believe it or not, is written and understood in the same fashion. It's not all given at one time. It's revealed piece by piece. So you got to go back and put in the puzzle as God gives them to you. Pearson's Law and the Bible. <clears throat> Look at Genesis 15. He said to Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. That's a prophecy. All right? That's a prophecy, whether you realize it or not. God just gave Abraham a prophecy that would not be fulfilled in his life. So he'd have to take it on faith that at some point down the road it would be fulfilled. And you shall go to your father in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come here again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Somewhere God had a measuring stick of sin. Like a, a balance of scales. In other words, Whatever God uses, and he says, okay, mankind has reached the point, they're not going to repent. I'm washing my hands of them. It's over. So at that particular point, it comes to like it was in the time of Noah, when it says, it was only in man's heart to do evil continually. God says, these people are never going to come to repentance. I wiped them off the face of the earth, and I'm going to start again. So in, in context, this is what God was doing when he told Abraham what was going to happen and with the Amorites. The iniquity of the Amorites were not yet full. Whatever that yardstick is, God used that sin that, to understand when he was going to make his decision to call it stop, the 400 years. And we saw that with the children of Israel. So 400 years they came out, 430 years to the exact same day. If we look back now over the recent years, we find that there is one clear spot that it appears that God has signaled that we have reached or we have getting, are getting close to the sins of the Amorites moment. All right, so now, so why do we go back and look at the timeline? Why do we go back and review? Because prophecy is written the same way. Now that we understand these things, now we go back and we look at the events. There's one event, there's one period of time that comes to play, 2015. Now, why would I take 2015? Because of God's signals in the heavens. Because there has to be something that tells us this is different from all the rest. And God says he's going to tell us the end from the beginning. Well, the end from the beginning, the only thing left are signs, the stars, the moon, the earth. So if God's going to tell us 
the end from the beginning. We have to look at something that God created that existed from the beginning. I mean, it's pretty simple. And that is the signs in the heavens. Genesis 1.14 said that. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. So that's the very beginning. Now, the problem with the Church of God community has been that it was taught so strongly by the Worldwide Church of God that you don't look at anything in the heavens and try to do, understand anything by the sun and the moon and stars. That's a pagan religion. Satan knew that. Satan knew that the only way that God would show us the end from the beginning is what he created. That was in the stars, the heavens. And he told us in Genesis that is what he's going to do. So Satan knew that. Satan knew the end and what, what, what's going to happen at the end. He understood all that. So he creates a counterfeit, a counterfeit that builds around the stars, around the moon and the sun. And he tells people, that's pagan, don't look at it. So what he does, he creates the counterfeit so that you don't do what God says to do. It's like reverse psychology for what he did there. Let them be for signs. Now, we've done this before, so I won't spend a lot of time here. For signs. Strongs in signs is oath, and it means a flag, a beacon, a, a monument, an, an omen, or an incense. In other words, when something happened in the stars, that's, that's a signal. 2015, we had that in the Blood Moon Tetrads. That was only the eighth time that's ever happened since Jesus Christ. In at least the last four that we know of for sure, all centered around some special event. Actually, we came over the, with the Columbus coming to America at, at one of those events around that period of time. The nation of Israel being established, modern-day Judah coming back. The control of Jerusalem, they had one there. And then in 2015... In 2015, everything began, began to change from physical. It had more of a spiritual overtone to it. And all those things began to move. It's also used as a mark. In Genesis 4, 15, God says, set a mark on Cain's forehead. That was a sign. And put a mark on his head. What are you going to do at the, at the, when, before Christ comes back? It says, mark those who cry and sigh for the abominations. So God's going to be able to put a sign, a mark on people's heads. It's going to be spiritual so that no one can touch you. You're off limits. Isn't it good to know as we go into the end time? It also comes from the, the, uh, the root word, 225, uth, which means to come or to bring forth. So here we have the signs in 2015, something to bring forth. And, and as I wrote in the book that I wrote back in 2013 and 14, is like this was a new beginning. It wasn't the end yet. It's like God was now moving. In other words, God was beginning to bring about his end time, his plan. So all those things began to line up. And as we go through that, we understand there was one last point I wanted to bring out in this, that God told us the end from the beginning. Here's the scripture that proves what I've just been quoting in Isaiah 46 and 10. So when we look at all of these events, what took place with the blood moon tetrads? Everything around the world began to change. The Pope began to rise. He came to America the entire planet now was being brought in together underneath the Pope. It began with the 2014-15 Tetrads. In 2017, it kicked the signs in heaven, which you see in Revelation 12. The end from the beginning. And all these things began to change as we went through it. So here's the cycles that we talked about before. The Shemitah, it tells you the time period bringing you to God's appointed times. Walking us through step by step. Step two, the doomsday clock. So God says that to know when these things, they have to be fruits. So in the fruits, we knew the doomsday clock were the conditions at the time when all this begins to happen. By, the, uh, by January 2023, it was showing that it was a year of transition. It was bringing us from where we were to where we're going to be at the end. And that's what we brought about the years with the economic lean that was coming through. And finally, and this is one that we have only touched on. I need to go back to that one because you see the bitter waters are approaching the, the waters of Mara. What God has done by revealing this information to us, it takes you out of the, pro, the, the prophecy to here and now. By understanding the process of what God's revealing through this, we pull in a brand new aspect that we're only beginning to understand and work through is taking us through the day by day. 
It takes the Bible out of prophecy into, like I said the other day, like a newspaper. Begin to read the news of what's taking place, and you know what's happening as you go through that. If you haven't seen this series yet, please take a look, because it is one of the most important of all the series. So now we're at the second seal now. We're coming to that in Revelation 6. He opened the second seal, and I heard a second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse, and it was red, and power was given him to set on to take peace from the earth. Well, that's the first thing of the red horse. So as we began last year understanding that we knew we were at taking peace from the earth. There was no doubt about that. I mean, there was no peace anywhere in this planet. So we knew we had to be reaching the second seal, especially if the first seal was open, and I believe it was with COP27. I believe we made a pretty good case for that. Somewhere down the road, we may say, oh, nope, here this came out, and that's that where, it's at, where it's at. I don't think so, but it could happen. You know, I'm just, I'm just giving you the, the opinion, the feeling, the understanding of all the scriptures that God's led me to, to make that statement. Because I've had many people say, don't you think the, the seals are open? And that was like five years ago, three years ago. I said, and I don't think so. I can't, I can't pin it down from Scripture. But I think we can now, at least the first two. So then what's going to happen after the peace, what comes next? The great sword. So in other words, something had to be brought about in that wars that bring about the change. So the physical events that foreshadowed the spiritual actually took place on the last great day of this feast when the armies went into Israel. I believe that is the time, and that's what we showed last time, we're confirming that we're at that particular period of time. So now we have the seals of Revelation as we went through. Here's the, sep the seals. If you're not familiar with it, I'm going to bring it in one more time because people don't catch every sermon. So if you've seen this and you know with it, just bear with me because I, I just want to lay it out again exactly where we are. In the seven seals of Revelation, God lays out the first four, and we know those as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as we understand. Then there's a period of time that's afterwards that brings us to a fifth seal, and the fifth seal begins to show as martyrdom of God's elect, God's saints. Your sixth seal is your heavenly signs, and somewhere between, I broke it up this way because of the way the church has taught it all the time, is that the three and a half period, period of tribulation and martyrdom, the church used to teach that you're going to be taken to a place of safety somewhere when the fifth seal happens and you'll be protected. Well, if it happens, I, I hope I'm there. I don't see it in Scripture because everything I see in Scripture, the saints are out there, they're on the front lines. Why did God have to go and seal us to protect us? Don't, don't hurt these people. I mean, this, I don't want to go there again because I did a sermon on that just not too long ago. But in other words, I don't think we're going that way. You know, I made the mistake of calling... Uh, property out here, the Joseph Project, a place of safety. Well, it's, it's really a place of refuge, so to speak. It's a place to work. And, and if I said like a place of safety, well, I think God will protect us there. But it, as far as a place of safety everybody goes to, no, I don't, I don't think that. I, I think there's going to be a lot of work and there's going to be a lot of hard work in, in, that we'll have to do out there. So then you get to the seventh seal and you have Christ's return. In the seventh seal you have that seventh seal, you have the uh, seven trumps, remember? And the seven trumps, each one, God begins to bring about more and more information and more and more judgments upon mankind. When the seventh trump sounds, you get the seven last plagues. So now, we're saying we're at the second seal. So the second seal is right here. Do you see all we have to go through yet? That's a lot to go through. And I'm saying, I don't say we have a lot of time. I want to clarify that because somebody wrote, to say, when you said we have, a, we have a long way to go, do you mean time? Or, or, no, I didn't mean time. I meant what we meant was, I think God's on his timeline. I meant all this has to happen. So things begin happening rapidly as we move through, is what I'm, I'm trying to say. Word of caution now. Here's the word of caution. It appears that once the second seal is open, and I think it has, Wars built until the fourth seal, a major time of calamity. So here's what you need to get your head wrapped around. If it is true, and I believe it is, that God has opened that second seal, what you're looking at going on in the world will not get better. It will get worse. There'll be periods of calm, 
that God will say, well, you know, they, they, well, they, they got everything under control. Then God says, when you think not, boom, that's when it comes. So it would be like the stock market. It goes up and it goes down. It goes up and it goes down. So now, let's put all that information on our timeline again where we're at. Are you with me today on this? I think it's smooth enough that we all understand it. Because I'm trying to keep it in perspective. I don't, if it gets, it gets over your head or I'm too complicated, it does no good by teaching this. That's why I keep going back piece by piece to put it together. By the way, I, go, I do it because I'm learning too as, you, as we go. And each time I do this and I go back to it, it's usually to add something to it, which is what I'm doing today. All right, so now, here's our seven years from 2022 where it began the, the uh, cycles. So we go through our seven years. And remember, the cycles end from the fall, from, uh, from atonement to atonement. So when you see one, like here, well, that's the end of the first year, 2023. That's the end of the first year. That's, that's where we're at now. So now, at the end of Atonement 2023, we're now in the second year. It begins the second year. So because we just got past Atonement. So we knew when we put all these things together years ago that somewhere down the road, and I did this, and if you haven't seen it yet, uh, The Day of the Lord. It's a, it's a, it's a multi-part series. It's online. Very important to understand the Day of the Lord. We brought this out, and this is where this is actually from. So we knew the seals would come. So we believed in, in the seals, the first seal. I, I, as far as I can see, I, everything about this seems to fulfill Scripture, is that being the first seal of the beginning of mankind coming together in the deception and removing God. So now we come to the second seal where we are today, what I believe just happened on the last great day of the feast. It is the beginning of the second year of the seven years of lean. So what beginning to understand here, is it possible that God's going to open a seal each year? I don't know. But watch how it lines up today when God does, when we put this together. In part one, we brought out four specific biblical points to make sense of the war in Israel in opening up that second seal. We're right there now. I believe we have just begun. So when you look at the news, what's going on? It's escalating and it's expanding. All right, so now the United States is being drawn into it. We sent fighters into Syria and blew up some things in Syria. All around, the threats continue to grow. So from a biblical alignment, it appears that the war began at the appointed time on the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And why do we think that? Is because it went into Israel. And one of the things Luke 21 tells us, I believe 20, Luke 21, 20, when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, you know that the end is near. In other words, get out of there. So what we have is the form of physical of that, that, that scripture, picturing the form, the latter spiritual at the time before Jesus Christ returns. So that means when this war begins, it don't stop. That means it's going to continue to escalate. The Middle East is not going to have the peace. They have ceasefires. They'll pull all the debt out, and they'll go back, and they'll fire again. And that's going to continue until Christ returns. Why? Luke 21, 20, 20 tells us so. Armies surrounding Jerusalem. That also tells you something else. The nuclear bomb isn't going off in Jerusalem because then nobody could be there. The people are still there. So the nuclear weapons isn't worried about it for Jerusalem, but for everybody around it and the United States. So here, going through it now. So this fulfills the role of the type of the physical that foreshadows the spiritual fulfillment of Luke 21, 20. When you see armies passing surrounding Jerusalem, know the desolation is near. It also aligns perfectly to the form of Joshua entering the promised land to the end time church as we prepare to enter the kingdom. So what begins to line up here, if you understood the waters of Mara, you would see that the events lining up here line up perfectly to the events of the former of Joshua going into the promised land. It's incredible what God has done laying out his scriptures. But you wouldn't know that if you didn't understand Mara. We wouldn't have understood Mara if we wouldn't have understood the ones before that. So just like Pearson's law, God takes it piece by piece by piece, and each one builds on the next. When you look back, you've just told a story. And that story builds a map. And that map tells you where you're going and keeps you on course. Now, going on. Is it possible 
The third seal happens next year. And I want to bring that out because remember last year, there was a lot of talk about hunger around the world. You notice that nobody's talking about that today? Does that mean there's people that are not hungry no more? <laughs> no. No, they got bigger fish to talk about. The hunger is still growing. The wars are still magnifying. The food supply is getting less. By the way, has anybody seen cheaper groceries in the store? Uh-uh. They just reported that America, just food and energy in one quarter went up 16%. GDP, 16% food and energy. Why? Because that fits the bill of Joseph's lean years. That's what Satan is hitting. So your food's getting more expensive. The debt continues to rise. Supplies continue to deteriorate. But people can still go to the store and buy things. So it hasn't hit them yet. And when they run out of money, what do they do? They charge it. And charging has reached a, a height it's never been at before. And the failure to pay the credit cards is higher than it's ever been. There's a lady in this audience who works at a bank. She'll tell you that. She's shaking her head, yeah. All of these things are happening right before everybody's eyes. But nobody's telling it because we got Bidenomics. How's it working for you? Then you've got the fourth seal. By the time the fourth seal, so if the wars keep building, you get to that fourth seal. When you line up the Joseph's lean years, what I'm showing you in just a second, that fourth seal lines up around 25 or 26. You know that people are talking about now around the world that we're going to be a major problem by 25 and 26? Well, we understood that in the church. Why? Because we understood the Bible. Can you believe that you can tell what's going to happen in the world by just going to the Bible? That's amazing, but that's what God's done for his people. You don't have to be an economics expert. If you just understood the lean years and what Joseph had and what you went through, you would know what you're going to happen. You don't need to know all the ins and outs of economics. You just need to know when you go to the store, you better have some money because it's getting lean. Revelation 6, verse 7 and 8, the fourth seal, when he opened, he looked and it was a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death and hell followed him and the power was given him over a fourth part of the earth. So I think about this often when I think about the churches of God who reject this information. Most of the bigger churches will not teach any of this because the worldwide didn't teach it and because they won't look at the stars and the sun, the moon, and the heavens. So they don't understand, just like the Pharisees in his day, where they're at in time. They can see that the end time's coming, but for pity's sake, you're going to tell people you might have 30 or 40 years? Where's the urgency here? There should be an urgency like we have never seen in God's churches and his people. Time is running out. When you look at this period of time, but you see, the Church of God community looks at, you go outside, it looks pretty today. They don't know that, let's say, a, a hurricane just entered the Gulf of Mexico. It's a Cat 5. And it's heading your way in two days, it's going to be here. And they say, oh, I know it's hurricane season. You know, look, it looks fine. You ain't nothing to worry about. We may get through this, we won't have to worry about this till next year. That's hogwash. And I'm telling you, and if you're listening, and whoever's tuning in, I'm asking you, if you know somebody in the Church of God community, you need to sit them down and share this information with them. Take my name off of it if that's the problem. Just give them the information. Because you see, time's coming, and it's short. And Satan's going after God's people, and that's going to be coming. So then you get to the fifth seal. Fifth seal is the mortar that begins to strike. The three and a half years of persecution, the Bible calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. And here's the warning that this period is where God's saying they're going to take you to a place of safety. My goodness, you better hope you're in the right one because they all say they're the only one, they're the right one, we're doing it better, we're cleaner, we're brighter, and God's going to take us, and if you want to come to a place of safety, you've got to be in this organization. I'm sorry, God don't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Now, the only one I knew could get away with that back then was Mr. Herbert because it seemed to make sense when there was one person in one church. But now there's five, six, seven hundred churches scattered all over the place. Just like was promised in Daniel. God said, when I have accomplished the scattering of the power of the holy people, then the end would come. But see, back then in World War, we thought there'd only be one church. Because, see, we didn't understand the prophecies yet. 
God had revealed all of that information that's out there. So now, let's begin to wrap through some of the news events of what's taking place. Let's confirm that the fruits of the time bear out what I just told you. World Watch. In the World Watch, the Middle East. In the Middle East, war in Israel broke out. Of course, everybody was telling us right before then, the, uh, the accords were coming in place. Saudi Arabia was thinking about joining into it. And there'd be peace, peace when there is no peace. Even Jake Tapper, our national security advisor. I'm going to play this again. I played it last time. Danny, you about ready with this? We're going to play it again so you can see. It's only about a minute and a half long. Play that video. Now, just last week, Biden's national security advisor made the following claim. Besides for now, because all of that can change. And the Middle East region is quieter today than it has been in two decades. Now, Brett Baer recently interviewed Saudi Arabia's crown prince, the de facto ruler of the country, and asked him how close Saudi was to recognizing Israel and establishing full diplomatic relations for the first time in history. Just a few days later, he asked Israel's prime minister the same question. So you think, if you were to characterize it, are you close? Every day we get closer. It seems it's for the first time a uh, real one, serious. We're going to see how it goes. You know, we just got back from Riyadh. I know you heard those words from the Saudi Crown Prince. What was your response? Well, I was delighted to hear what he had to say and to, to borrow a phrase. I think we're getting closer to peace every day that passes. Now, Senator Tom Cotton says crushing this potential peace deal was exactly why Hamas launched those attacks today on Israel. Cotton saying in a statement, quote, this war is a transparent attempt by Iran to derail the peace talks between Israel and Saudi Arabia. The United States should provide Israel the military and diplomatic support it needs to destroy Hamas, and the Biden administration should cease all engagement with Iran. Here's, Israel, here's Senator Lindsey Graham earlier. It's a major intelligence failure, uh, and we got to look at our own intelligence apparatus. How could this happen? You know, 9-11 happened. And former Defense Secretary Mark Esper said the same thing earlier. Griff, he said this was also an intelligence failure. You know who didn't fail with all that intelligence? God's holy word. Because it tells us there's going to be no peace before Christ returns, especially in the Middle East. So as they're getting closer and closer, they're thinking they're going to have peace. Satan says there's no way you're going to have peace. If the second seal was being opened, God said he's taking peace from the earth. And you remember what God's holy word says. Once the second seal is open, the scenario will only expand until we reach the fourth seal, affecting one-fourth of the planet. Global economy is moving in the wrong direction right now. Very rapidly, and the war in the Middle East hasn't even fully erupted yet. Iran's foreign minister threatens the U.S. and accuses Israel of genocide in a U.N. speech. The Iranian foreign minister... Hasi Amir Abdulholian warned that the U.S. would not be spared, he said, if it continues, to manage what he called the genocide in Palestine while speaking to the United Nations on Thursday. The expanding of the, the uh, scenario, Yemen, Turkey, and other Middle East nations are all gearing up. Even today, as I delivered this sermon, there are protests that have erupted all around the world. Everybody is focused on supporting the Palestinians against Israel. Unbelievable, but it's true. In Yemen, Yemen says they're ready to send hundreds of thousands of fighters against Israel. The leader of Yemen's uh, movement, Yemen, is ready to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people to fight alongside the Palestinians. Now, I intended to play three more sermons, but Danny, I'm going to kill that. So when I'm, I'm not going to go into it. I'll put them in news and nuggets because I want to use the time to finish the sermon for what I have it for. But I'll bring it out in news and nuggets. When you see the sermon, I'm not going to go to them. But the Yemen leader calling for a fight of 100,000 or more of his fighters ready to go in to fight. All right, following all that scenario, this news writer wrote, I, I wanted to spend time in this because this scenario is very important. Once the flow of the Middle East oil stops due to the war. The price of oil is going to go completely nuts, he said. And once that happens, a nightmare scenario could quickly unfold. Now, this is his scenario. Watch how close he is to the Bible, what the Bible says. 
The conflict will escalate, he says, into a regional war with the U.S. becoming directly involved. Well, he wrote this a couple weeks back. Well, it's getting to that stage already. This is the U.S. fighter jets strike Iran already in, in retaliation on the U.S. troops. There have been over 20 attacks by the Iranian proxies on the military of the U.S. trying to pull us into this conflict so they can escalate it into a global war to pull in China and Russia, eventually going into a world war. All that is at the beginning stages right now. They said OPEC will respond with an oil embargo. Remember the last time that happened was in 73 and 74. If you were alive during that period of time, you remember how expensive the, the oil got as it went up and how it was not available everywhere you went. They said they believe that Iran will close the Strait of Hormuz. The price of oil, they said, if they do that, could reach as much as $300 a barrel. Now, I don't know if that'll happen or not, but he believes in his, his findings that could happen. And he's putting against 73 and 74 when he looked at the percentage according to the ratio of where we are today. That would put oil at $300 a barrel. No telling how much gas would be. Wouldn't make any difference. We couldn't buy it. He said Europe would succumb to a full-blown energy crisis due to the LGN shortage. So all these things beginning to take place right now. All of these events, if they happen like he says, what does that do? It leads to a prophecy in Daniel. The Daniel's prophecies, all the events are the king of the north versus the king of the south scenario. Where the king of the north goes against the king of the south. Why? Because their economy's dying, they need oil. They can't exist without it. So now what you're looking at is the foundational steps as the second seal opens, begin to lay down the foundation to the third and the fourth, which is going to build, and according to Joseph, might take as much as two to three years. Where we are. In the meantime, things continue to get worse. He said we will have massive spikes in energy prices, which will reinvigorate the inflation in the central banks responding accordingly. Once that happens, the financial markets and the global banking sector will collapse. And it will. We got close to that in 2008. The debt crisis would engulf the U.S., forcing the Federal Reserve to yet enact another financial market bailout. That only takes and brings inflation even higher. So we mark to an, an in, increased inflationary process. The petrodollar trade will collapse because no longer they'd be dealing with the U.S., they'd be dealing with Russia and China in the Middle East. Then hyperinflation would emerge. Whether all of these things happen or not, time will tell. But in that scenario, that scenario points out what the Bible warns this is going to happen. So now I want to ask somebody who's thinking they're going to be taken to a place of safety in two or three years, how are you going to get through this? What are you doing to prepare for this? Because, see, this can happen over the next six weeks, beginning of the next two months of the next year. See what I'm talking about? There's a long way to get to that, that fifth seal. All these things are going to be coming into play. Now, let's go on a little further. Russia. Forgot about Russia. We're too busy talking about the Middle East. The Russia in the nuclear bomb. There's a rare video, and I showed it in News and Nuggets yesterday. I'll play it again next week, of Russia meeting in China. Believe it or not, he was in China, and behind him, just like here in America, carrying the nuclear suitcases, just in case something happens while he's gone. In the meantime, we see the satellite images showing the increased activity at the nuclear test sites in Russia, China, and the U.S. In other words, while we're all talking peace, everybody's building for war. The nuclear plants are building, they're expanding everything that's going on right now. Why isn't anybody being told this? They don't want you to hear what's going on. Again, I won't use this video till next time because, it, because I need the time. And let's not forget Little Rocket Man. Little Rocket Man, whenever something happens, he wants to say, don't forget me, I'm still over here and I got, I got nukes. Kim Jong-un, he shoots his nuclear test. Look at the test he put in 6, 9, 13, 16, and 17. And those tests were not small tests either. The, the most recent one was somewhere between 70 and 280 kilotons in size. How big is that? Well, the bomb that was dropped on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was somewhere around 21 kilotons. So this is anywhere from 4 to 11 times the size of what was dropped on Japan in 45. 
going on. We just have a few hours later after we saw Putin carrying his, his nuclear suitcases, just a few hours later, after the U.S. said we're not planning any tests on our nuclear plants, they perform a test in the U.S. The U.S. conducted a nuclear test in Nevada. So it comes out, you're going to carry your nuclear weapons? Well, we're going to go shoot off a test. Boom. And so now everybody else says, well, if the U.S. can do it, so can we. So we just keep escalating this war that's going on. The test just came hours after lawmakers said they planned to revoke the ratification of the nuclear uh, test treaty ban. All these things are taking place. So Russia is closely monitoring the U.S. in Nevada, as the spokesman said. So the Russia state media is reporting on Friday that the Kremlin is close to monitoring the high explosive experiment that the U.S. carried out at his nuclear test site. So and that just tells you what, what they were testing and how. So now, let's get back to all that going on. So here's the fruits of where we are. Now, does the world, does the fruits of this world just understand what we're saying that's going on in the spirit world? Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're, they're like a glove that's come together now. All these things are, are mixing up. So now we're back at that seal where I just left a few minutes ago. So now let's begin to look at this and see where we're at. Does that line up to the former with Joseph? So in 42 and 43, that's the first two years. Remember, he says, go buy us some food. The second time, go buy us a little food that we can live. You have just began in the time sequence of the former right there. So that means by the end of 2024, it began on atonement 2023, the second year. So you're in that second year. And in that, by the time the end of the second year, you got in the Old Testament saying, go buy us a little food so we can live. What comes next in the third seal? Famine. Famine. In other words, the balance is, you know, be careful with the food. Don't, you know, it's a delicate balance of what's going on here. Then by 47, 13 through 22, it shows during that period of time, Israel is moved into Egypt. And I thought this was ironic. Now, I'm not trying to build more out of it than is there, but there's something here. This opened up at that same time period. I think what God's done here is moved us to a place to continue to work. That's my guess. Because you see, there's nowhere to go and hide in this time frame. But there will be a place that we can't work here. The city's going to shut it down. The gangs will be in the streets. This is not going to be safe in the next few years, whether you realize it or not, whether you can see it yet or not. And I know God can protect you where you are. But there's also a warning that God says, hey, listen, you need to be wise. And so this wisdom is saying, look, it's not, it's not safe to stay around an area that's deteriorated so bad. So any of these periods, they're all lining up. So when you see that, what are we looking at? The four horsemen, all lining up. By that time, that fourth, that fourth seal hits, a quarter of the planet is wiped out. And then what's really interesting is in, in the former, after the horsemen, you got three years. It says the... Joseph's family increased while the world deteriorated. And when I look at this project, I'm looking at the greatest work that God's promised at the end time when the innumerable multitude come out of tribulation. In other words, I believe our work will increase just like Joseph's family's work increased while the world deteriorated. And we'll be able to serve those people that God brought out of that tribulation. They're going to be in despair. They're going to be hungry. They're going to be tired. It'll be the time of Jacob's trouble. I honestly believe that God has given us an opportunity like no other time in the history of mankind for his work. These first two years, Israel was not in, in Egypt. The second two years, he was. The next two years, God moved him all to into the work on, in Egypt. By the fifth year, famine and, bam, uh, and bondage was across the land, and Israel was protected. And at the end of those years, Pharaoh owned everything. Everything. Every man, every woman, and every child, the food, except Israel and his people. 
when you look at Revelation, that is the scenario you find. A global world being ruled by a beast power, being run by a woman who sits on the beast, ready, prepared to fight Christ. And that is where we are today. So now, the approaching the waters of Mara, understanding that journey, what we learn from the waters of Mara is a series that we have moved from the prophetic scenario of God's plan to the here and now. We're living in the latter day, the parallel period of time, just before the return of Jesus Christ. No different than the Israelites who moved into the promised land and began their seven years of war. As I said before, once the seal is open, it will only expand. And we're at that time right now until we reach that fourth seal and that massive explosion of one quarter of the planet on this earth. The opening of the second seal. Has God opened that second seal? Oh, yeah, I think he has. I think we can continue to make that case, and I will the next time I speak on part three of opening the second seal of Revelation.